And we're starting off with the learning objectives. What products must comply? Which standards are acceptable? Uh, that will be a fun one. How to find disclosure in the product data? Always uh, challenging in how to fill out the template, where I'll show a live template. Oh, I see what you mean, Mark. Now it moves quickly. Um, first off, a little history of this credit, which we're focusing on, uh, that being green flooring systems. Uh, in the old days, it just used to be green carpet. You didn't have carpet, you didn't get the point. You know, it was very simple. It had to be green label certified by CRI, Copper and Rug Institute. And cushions, although I don't believe anyone uses cushions anymore. Products that must comply are just about everything. All carpets and cushions, if they do exist anymore, carpet adhesives, all hard flooring systems, aluminum, laminate flooring, which would include engineering, hardwood flooring, ceramic flooring, rubber flooring, wall base. Uh, finishes for concrete, wood, bamboo, and cork, and now tile setting adhesives and grout. Now, Richard, so under LEED NC 2.2 and earlier, as you said, it was just carpet, and it was uh, Carpet and Rug Institute, and, and so this is uh, LEED 2009, and this applies for um, both um, uh, all the different certification programs, 4.3 is uniform across the uh, commercial interiors. Um, so this is applicable. It is, Correct? yes. yes. That's not always the case, but under this um, credit, uh, it, it is across all the rating systems. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Rating systems? Yes. And this is version 3.0 that I'm reviewing. So moving uh, over to uh, slide number six, the um, what products are exempt. And you won't see this if you have a first edition of the uh, lead reference guide for green building design construction. Uh, this came out in the addenda. Uh, and those exempt products are mural-based tile, masonry, or terrazzo, or cut stone with no integral organic-based coatings or sealants or, and unfinished untreated solid wood flooring. Those are the only exceptions. So, it, but um, when we're talking about exceptions, unfinished untreated solid wood flooring would, would rarely be used inside. Normally, um, I suppose that could be what, a, a, a recycled plank or something? It, it um, could be. But and, you're, you're right, I don't think there's any situation where that would apply. There's always some finish. And uh, do you know whether terrazzo and epoxy terrazzo and cementitious terrazzo um, all fall under this, or whether the uh, the epoxy matrix of terrazzo bounces is out of here, and this would only be cementitious terrazzo? Yeah, this can get uh, confusing. Uh, it's only when there's uh, no integral organic base coatings, then epoxy is not going to be that case. Very few situations. Uh, cut stone is the best example. Even terrazzo may have some organic based coatings. So for the most part, it's cut stone and solid wood. But even there, there's always finishes, which is the caveat. And if you do have tile, of course, you're going to have grout. That's and right. uh, if you have stone, you might have grout. And so using the grout, uh, I guess you're still exempt. You're exempt on the for product, but not on the grout, as this caveat shows here. Uh, although they have this, these few ex exemptions, you still have to apply to the adhesives, grouts, finishes, and sealers. So it'll be clear to the next few slides here. So before we had one standard, and now we have seven standards. So this is where it gets fun. Uh, you have the green label plus for carpets. Uh, this smaller one, the green la label, is for cushions, which I don't think exist anymore. And then you have South Coast Air Quality Management District. That takes care of finishes and adhesives. Uh, four score is a new one for four products that are not exempt. There are, all, there are very few that are exempt. And then you have option two, the, the top line here is option one. Option two in this 
credit has to deal with California Department of Health Services. It's now been changed to Health Care Services. And by default, Green Guard would be in compliance and then in independent uh, laboratory testing. Now, I've shown this slide with some references. These go back to my earlier slides. So if you want to come back to the slideshow, you can um, keep track of this. And these numbers will appear in the future slides. So CRI Green Label and Green Label Plus are essentially equivalent for the for the, you know, there are residential applications and uh, sometimes multifamily that still use uh, uh, cushions. So, you know, we see those in our practice. But what you're saying that all seven of these uh, groups, um, uh, potentially a building product manufacturer, uh, could have tested with, with one or more of these groups and that would still be acceptable as documentation. Yes, with the caveat that there are now two options. The top row is option one, the, the uh, bottom row is option two. Okay, and you're going to explain that now? Or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I'm going to explain those in the next few full slides. Well, this is why this one here is really challenging. They're really uh, making you earn this credit. So here are the standards uh, names. Uh, the Numbers are listed here, one through five, will line up with these numbers here by the logos. The Copper and Rodden Force uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District, this is Rule 1168, which is also EQC4 credit one. Uh, four score is number three, number four is South Coast again, and this fits under uh, Paints and Coatings, EQC 4.2, and then the last one is South Coast for tile adhesives and grouts. And that fits under EQC 4.1. So what you see here is a mixture of three credits. And the reason why they repeat it is that not all projects will seek all three credits. So if you don't go after adhesives and sealants, but you do want to go under, go after the green flooring systems, you have to meet number two. And the same for number four. If you're not going after artificial coatings in your checklist, but you do want to go after flooring systems, you have to meet uh, this part of artificial coatings. And um, Richard, just stepping in here for a second. Um, one of the members, Phil um, Gaddis, just wanted to mention that um, he believes that CSC Indoor Advantage would also comply as long as Green Guard complies. I'm not sure if that's right or if that's something you've addressed or worked with. Oh, but that was a point that was brought up. Well, yeah, I want to get the Green Guard. Uh, if it meets Green Guard and it includes the California um, option, then that's true. But it, it me doesn't explicitly accept that. But by default, as you'll see in a minute, through Green uh, Green Guard, that may be true. And we're we'll moving on with this uh, option two in the credit. It's the California Department of Health Services. And you have to use this standard in order for it to comply. And by default, Green Guard does use that standard, so it would meet option two. And the last option is the approved independent laboratory. And I'll give examples of these. So this is a complex credit. It's, it's no longer just carpets. And you get the point. Now, the number again refers back to what uh, category we're referring to. The first one is just a straight green label plus certification. And what I do is ask for a copy of the certification. This is a, the actual certification. It has a GLP four digit number and it has an expiration date. Are they, uh, do you know if they expect uh, manufacturers to renew every year? That's why the uh expiration date is there and and what is uh, what is a an architect or a person doing lead compliance uh, should they worry about that date they should yeah they should indeed and you're right they do have to renew if they're not renewed then the carpet theoretically is not in compliance and potentially I suppose if somebody dropped out of the program they could have specified it when they knew they had a certificate and uh, 
and then uh, find out later that it had expired. So I guess it is, um, as you say, when you're doing construction administration services, you ask for a current certificate to come in with the submittals for the section. I do, yep. And I guess we're working on good faith here. You would assume that the carpet manufacturer is going to renew their certification. But well, but, but sometimes they also stop making a carpet. That's true. Right. That's a different problem, I guess. And there's actually a question related to that. Um, sure. Does the date apply to the manufacturing date of the material? And if so, how would we know? <laughs> That's a very good question. Uh, we don't well, always know. Uh, it is related to the manufacturing date, and you can uh, inquire to when the, the product was manufactured. And generally, it's going to be in the last year that you have ordered the carpet. And if you have a, a certification date that's older than a year, then I would definitely question. But we don't know the exact uh, date that correlates with the um, certificate. Well, the, you're looking for um, a product that has an active certification. So um, if you got something that um, had ex expired um, recently, then you'd have to find out. I mean, carpet, most carpet doesn't sit around for more than a year. Um, right. Yeah, so in m most cases, that's not an issue. If we're talking about furniture, that may sit in the warehouse longer, and then you want to pay more attention to the uh, manufacturing dates. And these are manufacturing dates. So as a lead uh, consultant, I always ask for the certificate. You may um, sometimes see the GLP number or a reference to that it's uh, GLP uh, compliant, which I don't accept. And I'll give a, a bad example next. And then we also had one other question. Actually, I believe it went for the slide before this. So while you're there, if you could go back one. Yep. Um, there was a um, statement that I believe the addendum deleted wall base. Um, it was the fourth bulleted item that was deleted. The new replacement fourth bullet point um, does not include wall base. I'm not sure if that was for this slide or the slide previous to that. Um, this one here? Correct. I think it may have been related to that one. Yeah, it, I'm not aware of um, the wall base being deleted. Um, my understanding that wall base is included unless there's been a real recent addenda. I'll have to look into I that. Will. Yeah, oh. uh, that I'm, I'm not aware of. They they did delete one category in the rating system. It had to do okay. with the percentage of uh, floor score on the overall flooring, but uh, that's not the question. I don't believe that was asked. To my knowledge, the wall base is sure. still included. Okay, we can. Yep, I am. That, I am sending her a response now, hoping to find the answer in okay. case I misrepresented her question. Okay. So here's a a, a bad product data. I'm going to blow this up. It's through Atlas Bubbles. Um, you always want to look for the product name at the top. Uh, the primary backing, which is the CRS base, is probably polypropylene. Here the Green Label Plus certification number is a eight-digit number and CRI uses four-digit numbers so this alerted me to a, a conflict. So I called the manufacturer and uh, certainly there's no expiration date. So when, when you have a product that does not have a date, I would not accept it. So I called the manufacturer and, and asked why there was this conflict. The CRI uses a four-digit system, and yet uh, they were producing an eight-digit system. And it was not listed in the, on CRI's website. So I got this response from the Atlas um, technical person. Uh, speaking in a foreign language, I have no idea what the, these numbers mean, the 1Y, 17Y, and he was generally making uh, some sort of statement that uh, CRI had omitted uh, one of their certified carpets, uh, or I omitted it. But whatever, I, I asked him again, that, uh, and here's the email, this is what I downloaded from Carpet Rug Institutes and it listed five carpets from Atlas and not 
not one of them matched the product data. So finally, after a third prompting, he must have gone to CRI and um, done something because uh, on today's uh, website it did appear, which I'll, I'll come up okay, later. So just just showing that everyone involved is human. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, when you okay. see something like this, it makes you wonder uh, if it's, it is the certified carpet and you're getting a run around or is this a mistake? And in this case, uh, it was either Atlas or CRI not being up to date with the information on the website. So it, it is certified and I'll show you the website at the end of the slideshow. I'm going to the next. The next category we're going to discuss is category two, which has to do with uh, copper adhesives. We're all used to this. It's uh, the first uh, low emitting material credit, 4.1. And here's the date. The date's very important. It's uh, a very recent uh, product data. Uh, when you see stuff like this, uh, it's sometimes, it, well, they're not misleading because it does meet uh, GLP. It is GLP certified, but LEED is not asking for GLP. In this case, it's asking for a South Coast reference, which is the 1168. But they, it also reference that. So it is in compliance, but not because of that. And that can get confusing. So under the product data, rule 1168, it, it's a 14 grams per liter, and the limit is 50, so it is in compliance. So Green Level Plus will give an adhesive a certificate number? It will. It, but, it, but that's not it's what It's useless. So, well, as far as LEED goes, it, it, they don't uh, request it. They request that it meets these limits. And uh, this gets into the final point of LEED. It's confusing. Most Green Label Plus adhesives will meet the uh, uh, South Coast limits, but they're not. It's not the official reference. This is the official and and so if if this lead credit was audited by the, um, um, you would need to produce. This is the document that would uh, satisfy them. It, exactly. If you submitted the Green Label Plus uh, certificate, they would um, not accept it. They're looking for this. If you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good point. If you submit a documentation with a DLP certificate, they would not accept it because this is a reference. And this reference meets the limit, which is 50. Moving to the next slide. Uh, here's the, the new certification on the market. It's um, four score, and it's for VCT. And here's the registration number, and it's valid. So they give it a range. So there's a two-year range that it must uh, comply under. And in most cases, the, the VCT in a manufacturer's plant is not going to be more than two years old. But this should be renewed. And when you request one, it should be an up-to-date one. So this is what I would submit to to lead for documentation to this actual certificate. Uh, the, spec the specification would ask the subcontractor to submit this so the architect doesn't have to go hunting. So uh, you, you would <laughs> Yes, uh, hopefully the, the specification does ask for this so we, we don't have to do this runaround. And then the specs that I work with uh, do have that r request. The next category is number four. And this has to do with uh, finishes. It's a water-based polyurethane clear, and you want the exact name of the product that you're using in your building. And it's the clear satin. And this, these blanket statements are void because they don't mean anything. And as you can see here, this is for 2.2, but this documentation is for a lead project version 
uh, but here's the uh, truth in the pudding right here. It's uh, less than 250 grams, and under this category, the limit is 350, so it does meet it. There is, uh, uh, you know, every day I think we all get product literature that um, uh, claims that this product will uh, earn four more credits or two yeah. more credits or, um, of course, probably the, the more precise language being a specifier is that it contributes to, or in some cases, it, it doesn't lose the credit. It, you know, it, um, um, this floor score, um, you need you need the information, but you're you're looking for products that are going to avoid it, not products which will achieve it, or I, I perhaps perhaps both. Um, it's difficult. Yeah, and you make a good point. Under the MR credits, um, products contribute to credits. Under the low mitting, they can kill the credit <clears throat> because under um, flooring systems, uh, you all products have to comply. So if you had one flooring material that did not comply, you would not get the point. So you're correct. Right, and you know, it, it, there, you look at certain credits and, um, you know, for a while, the rapidly renewable credit is rarely, rarely chased. Um, the uh, no urea formaldehyde requires a little bit of a chase. Mm -hmm. And uh, this uh, floor score is now more difficult than the recycled content one to chase. That's right. Yeah, I, I think this is going to be the most difficult one. If you're well into, um, you know, if you're going for silver and you've got seven extra credits, um, you know, quite frankly, we've had people who, uh, designers who just want to minimize their paperwork. So you can minimize your extra credits by cost or by paperwork. And, and uh, some folks won't go after it. Um, not because the products wouldn't comply. They may very well comply. It's just that it's a burden to collect the data. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. And there is another question here referencing, um, does CA-10350 still substitute for floor score, or is the reference standard referring strictly to floor score? CA-10. I'm not, I'm not familiar with CA that. CA-10350. I'm not familiar with that. Oh, sorry, CA-01350. Oh, yeah, that's the, um, the, the section of the California um, standard. Uh, that is acceptable, and, and I'm actually going to touch upon that. Okay, great. In a minute, yeah. Okay, and then lastly on this um, Olympic uh, polyurethane clear, you want to look for the date. And this one is 508, two years old, but I would accept it. Anything more than two years old, I would not accept it. We're down to category five, which is a, a new category. So if you have an exempt cut stone but you're using a mortar to uh, adhere it to the floor, you, the, the mortar has to be in compliant. The stone wouldn't have to be, but the mortar would be. And this is one example of a compliant mortar. And the manufacturers use these terms um, equally, mortar and adhesive. It's the same thing. Uh, not to get you confused whether they call it a tile adhesive or a tile mortar. They're, they're the same thing. Uh, the date, first off, is important. Although adhesive and mortar and thin said mortar are actually different. Um, I think you might know the difference if you were holding adhesive in your hand or mortar in your hand unless, um, unless the manufacturers are saying there's really no distinction. Mm -hmm. And what, well, is, what is... Yeah, I'm just referring to the... Um, the mortar. Nomenclature. Yeah, All they right. use the mortar and it's really adhesive. It's not really a, uh, a mortar in the sense of uh, concrete or a mortar you'd use with brick, but it's more of adhesive to the floor. Uh, avoid that, these, uh, I'm sorry? On, on that page, what did, do you have any idea what green innovation means or those other symbols they're using? Uh, I don't then they're to be ignored. Any logo on the, the product uh, data sheet should be ignored. But we're just looking for limits of the, the, the standards. But I don't know that one. And there's a lot out there. This uh, EBN, Ubuntu Billing News, has a, a recent report 
that lists over 100 certifications in the U.S. alone. And uh, I'll touch on that report. It's a good resource. Uh, there, there are many, many of them. And you, you do have to uh, stay on track and just refer to the ones that lead references. Uh, so avoid blanket lead statements. Uh, this says it, it can, can contribute, but you don't know that until you know whether it meets the uh, limits. Uh, again, it applies, this product, particular product, applies both to flooring systems and ATs of the concealant. But uh, either one of those statements means it complies. And the truth in the pudding is right here. The Ultraflex 2 has a zero grams per liter. The limit is 65. And it's South Coast rule number 1168. So this is a good product that doesn't leave any guesswork. When they start doing this stuff, it gets confusing. But this is what you want to see. And going down to the default rules under option two, this is the California compliance path. Um, that question you just had, Matt, was referring yeah. to California section 01350. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So this California Department of Health Services standard method for testing evaluation of organic, organic compounds is the acceptable standard by LEED. And it's the standard that Green Guide uses. So by default, because Green Guide uses that standard, it complies. And in, in the other name for it, it's section 01350. So this product, which is for a engineered uh, hardwood floor, does comply, even though, even though it's not floor score certified, because it meets the the other compliance path. Uh, it would comply. And finally, the last option under compliance path two is a independent laboratory. It happens to be Berkeley Analytical, but there are, are a few independent labs that are approved by FlowScore. So would you know if um, the ICCES or UL Environmental also, um, their certifications would comply? I would think they would, but I don't know that for a fact. <laughs> yeah, unless they tie into the section 01350, if they use that as their um, methodology, I would say yes, because that would be an independent lab. And if they can show that they're using this methodology, uh, my answer to that would be yes. And there's a question regarding that. Um, doesn't the CA um, section 01350 that we're talking about, doesn't that just describe the testing method and not the VOC limits? Is the question well, that is being raised. Yeah, it's a testing method that it has to pass. So if it passes that method, then the VLCs is um, uh, acceptable. It, it, it's a methodology that's used that it has to pass. So you have to assume that it passed the that um, that method. So it would it would comply. need a, it would need a value. So it wouldn't pass. It it isn't just put it in this type of chamber oh, or no. box. It's put it in this chamber and achieve the following results. Yeah, here. Yeah, I haven't finished this um, page here. Uh, the date's important. It's for ceramic tile, and right here it says this meets section 01350. Yeah, you just can't put it in and say that's the method we use. You have to also confirm that it passed, and, and here's that statement. Now, that the yellow wasn't put in by me. It was put in by Dell Tile, who's up in arms about uh, having to be full score certified, because there are some uh, ceramic tile manufacturers who are, and Dell Tile refuses to because they don't feel a need to. They feel it should be exempt. And here's their. Now here's the protocol of California Department of Health Services. Um, it's the one that's uh, in the new addenda for this credit that's acceptable. So it's, it is pointing that out. It's an independent lab. Now, the tricky part is that this here is for ceramic tile. I was reviewing submittals 
for mosaic tile and quarry. So I, I put that question to Dell Tile. That this wasn't specific to uh, these other products that I was reviewing. And he pointed to this last page in the report. Sample is considered to be representative of the worst case for potential emissions for all Dell Tile. And it lists a few other manufacturers. And their argument is that uh, when you have a kiln firing process of 2,000 degrees, that it would totally eliminate any organic compounds, and thus it would be zero VOCs. Now, that hasn't been put to the test by uh, a lead review yet, but uh, I, I think they have a strong case. So I did accept it. Right. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to your your judgment and uh, the documentation that, that you provided. This is certainly a reasonable uh, interpretation on your part. But, um, you know, Dow Tile and American Orlean, that, you know, there must be 100 different types of tile. And some oh, are yeah. glass and some are metal and some right. are ceramic. And if you look at the um, um, Tile Council of North America, ceramic um, has some subsets. Mm-hmm. That's true. And so First tile is a type of ceramic tile, in my understanding. Mm -hmm. Although they're not all fired at 2,000 degrees, but they're all pretty high temperatures. And the Del Tile's argument is that there wouldn't be any uh, detectable VOCs at the end of this process. Although, since there are some ceramic tile manufacturers who are floor score certified, LEED has it in the template, which I'll show in a minute. And, and that's why it was my concern to Dell Tile that uh, they show full score certification, <coughs> which they didn't, but they, they have an independent laboratory testing, so it was accepted. And here's the template. And I'm going to go to the template live. Hopefully. OK. Can you see my template now? Yes. OK, this is a live template. It won't work as a PDF. It has to be live. So I'm actually into one of my projects. Uh, first off, you have to select the, the options. And in this case, in most jobs, you're going to have to check off both options. <clears throat> if you didn't check off an option, requirements would close on the template. So it's when you do check them off, things expand. This is one of the reasons why you don't want to look at a template and not answer the questions, because you won't see all the requirements until you start answering questions. It's a, um, a unique feature to the 3.0 templates. Now, there, there may be some specifiers out there who say, well, I never fill up the templates. Why should I be bothered with this? Well, you can learn a lot from these templates, from executing a template. And I know Mark, I always give Mark um, viewing rights to our online templates. They can be very useful. So in this case, uh, we have materials on the project that are applied to both options, the standard option one and California Department of Health Services. Now, this first table is flooring adhesives and sealants. It goes right back to adhesives and sealants credit, 4.1. I can't do anything with uh, these numbers. It just copies the other template, which is good. So you don't have to repeat it. This repeats here because uh, this information is required to earn the point. So that's easy. The next matrix, you have to enter all the flooring materials and finishes. And you do that by choosing the product from the drop-down box. Now, you might say, where do these, these headings come from? It comes from the addenda. Let me go to that slide. Under the latest uh, reference guide, that table one that was an awful table to work with um, in my last project with Mark, we tried to incorporate that table one into the specs. And it was very tedious. And uh, as it turned out, it was incorrect. Uh, Lee quickly realized their mistake. And they made this table one addenda, which spells out which reference refers to which product. So this. Table one is now makes it very clear on how these um, three different references apply to different materials. So I highly recommend that you use this uh, table one when you're making references uh, to green flooring materials. It'll be very useful. Now, let me go back to the template. So the, these here come right from table one. 
flooring wood. Uh, I'll just go through a few of them quickly. Uh, here's an exemption. When you have an exempt material, in this case it's granite stone. So it's completely natural material. And it automatically comes exempt. I can't touch this. This comes with the um, template. And uh, this box automatically checks it off that it's, uh, it meets the standard. <coughs> and it, it's an NA because uh, we don't need to reference any certification data. Where all the other ones for um, this one, for example, is and actually I changed that one by accident. It is carpet indoor uh, green level plus certificates and floor score certificates. I request, I always request certificates rather than accepting what's stated in the product data. And lastly, we have the California Department of Health Services standards. And these are products that are not floor score certified but meet these standards. And how do they meet them? In the case of Anderson, it's a green card certificate. In the case of Dell Tiles, independent laboratory, as we already pointed out. Now this last column document provided uh, under the lead rules, you have to provide 20% of the documentation. Under our specs, we override that. Uh, if the owner is paying for uh, green products, we want to see all the documentation. So we have 100% of documentation compliance. And somewhere it says right here, percentage of source of VOC data provided is 100%. And that's how we work our projects. We don't want only 20% because then we don't know if the contractor is doing due diligence on the other 80%. And so we always ask for all the product data. So Mark, uh, this may be more understandable now. Yes, thank you. On the product data information. Now here are three I just uh, put up there that with a few exemptions. It's highly unlikely you'll have this option, unfinished, untreated wood solid floor. But it's there. And uh, mineral-based, uh, that would, again, be like a cut stone. And it automatically comes up as meeting CA, and it would be an A in this column. So if you work through these templates, it, it helps you understand the, the credit intent. Uh, this is the best tool is this working through a uh, a lead template uh, online. Yeah. So uh, our next slide, I think I went to it. Yes, I just showed an example of the live template and then this is the addenda to table one, which is very useful. And actually while you were talking about that, that's that listed the different floorings. There is a question about, do you have any advice for concrete flooring? Um, we can specify the sealer under EQ 4.1, mm -hmm. but does LEED need some sort of compliance for EQ 4.3? Yes, yeah, that's what the caveat. Yeah, okay, so concrete, that caveat in the beginning. Yeah, the concrete itself is exempt, <clears throat> but if you have any finishes on that concrete, it has to comply. And it bounces back to um, EQ uh, 4.1. So, but and that so does, that's, re that's relevant when people are doing um, uh, stained concrete or polished concrete, because both of them um, it is, yes. add chemicals. That's right, yeah, especially stains. And the stains have a, a VOC limit. So to answer that question, you would uh, the sealer or the, uh, the finish would have to comply, even though the concrete uh, itself does not have to comply. So here I list some uh, common websites that apply to flooring systems, uh, Copper and Rugs Institute. Let's see if I can go live. No, I won't go live. No, you're, you're pushing your luck. <laughs> I think no, that, I, I, again, people will be able to, um, um, you know, review this um, PowerPoint again. Um, yeah, no, it, it does go live. Okay. And it goes on a commercial carpet. I just want to point out the Atlas uh, uh, point I made earlier. So now we're under commercial uh, carpets. 
and well, you don't always make it easy. Okay, so you have to choose this box of the GLP carpets, and then you have a list of manufacturers. You choose Atlas, and it's pretty good. <coughs> it bounces right into their products. So now you have the list of all uh, Atlas's products. So this morning, that 4428, the, the mystery 4428, appeared on the website. So um, somebody did something. So now I'm more comfortable. Before, I did not see the number here. And, and when there's not transparency with the product data, then I get nervous. OK, now let me see if I can get out of this and go back to the slideshow. OK. There we go. And then while we're back at the slideshow, I think a okay. similar yep, a similar question to the previous one. Um, does the caveat and or does this um, area also relate to industrial maintenance coating systems um, that are applied to a surface like a resinous flooring material? Um, I mean, after the fact, after the building is certified, you know, down the road they'll uh, apply a, a finish. No, it, it sounds like a resinous flooring that might be in a mechanical room, and I would say it would certainly. Yeah, apply. yeah, it would. Yeah, okay. yeah, because sometimes there's questions about uh, products used during maintenance, you know, down the road, and those are not um, required to comply because we have to work with the present. But anything that's applied during construction. Uh, would would have to comply with this um, credit. <laughs> then we have the four score uh, website at Green Guard, and I, I also um, do in there the South Coast and California Department. You don't need to go to these websites unless you just have interest in them um, because they, they're the, the standards that are accepted. And then if you want the latest uh, a lead addenda, you go to this site. This, this one's very difficult to find, so this uh, link would be useful. And they, here's the article I was referring to earlier on environmental building news it has this new information booklet on over a hundred certifications in the US and what they all mean and how they apply to green building. Now for those of you who are interested in it, if you do buy the booklet, you can and you answer questions online, you can earn six learning unit credits from this uh, guide. And finally, a quick review, then I'll open the floor to questions. What products must comply? All flooring products except for solid wood and mineral-based finished products. Standards are CRI Green Label, Floor Score, South Coast, and California Department of Health Services. How to find disclosure? Request specific product data and certificates. And don't accept MSDSs or blanket lead statements and lead tables. Now, sometimes MSDSs, uh, manufacturer safety data sheets, will have the information that we're looking for, but not always. It's it's easier to use product data. And finally, how to fill up the template? Um, refer back to the sample and just practice just doing the template. And now we're into the questions. Alrighty, I have one already here for you. Um, what do you advise with respect to floor polish systems for LEED NC projects that may transition to LEED EV buildings? Um, and the quote to that then is, many construction contracts inc uh, include application of floor polishes as part of the contractor's responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Well, it, we'd have to compare the two uh, rating systems, but my bet is that they're the same for that um, installation. I don't think they would differ. Is that the question? Which which rating system uh, you would have to comply to? It was really disrespect. You know, if you started working with the lead NC, but it, eventually the project evolved to a lead EB, were there any things that you you know advised related to that? But if you think that they both kind of address at the same level, I think that you can answer that. Well, that's two different um, uh, periods of time. The the first being the, the initial building would be certified under NC and then down the road you're recertify under EB, if that's the question? Correct. Yeah, then you would have to, well, you're not going to remove that surface, are you? 
uh, I guess it, if it differed and you had a material under NC that didn't comply for EB, I don't know if you would want to remove the surface and apply the uh, EB compliant material or not pursue the credit. It is a good good one, but my bet is that they're they're the same. I, I can't see them being different. Any other questions out there? Uh, let's see here. I was looking up information on one. Um, in a renovation project, does underlayment also have to comply? Underlayment, as a cushion or uh, as a uh, substrate? For example, uh, cementitious underlayment, um, Ardex, Coaster, um, ah. people like that that are okay. applied to perhaps level a slab. <laughs> yes. Uh, the answer to that is no. It, there's nothing in uh, the flooring system credit that refers to underlayment. So uh, there would be no. Now, if that was a wood product and it had uh, urea formaldehyde in it, it might affect other credits, but not uh, the flooring systems. Would you know whether, uh, for example, sometimes in a, in, a, in a restroom there is a waterproof membrane underneath the tile? Um, are there any requirements for that waterproof membrane? Again, the answer, my answer would be no. Um, they make reference to adhesives to the substrate and the finishes on top, but not what you're doing to the material below. Uh, however, if you did have, um, I know there's some manufacturers like uh, Laticrete that have a fluid applied membrane that's also a setting material, then I guess it counts as an adhesive. That's right, and then it would, it would bounce back to the other credit. Okay. Yeah, and in the same vein, if it was a coating, it might bounce back to the painting credit, in which case it would have to comply if you're pursuing that credit. I don't know that it would. Um, um, oh, so in other words, if you were just uh, uh, painting striping on the floor or painting a... Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <clears throat> or you were sealing uh, a, a, the substrate, the concrete, for example, um, before you you put the finished material on. The, the, um, the sealing of the concrete may come under paint, and then the finished material would come under flooring systems. And if you had a, um, a parking garage in the basement of a building, um, um, I don't know the answer to this question either, whether well, the uh, dealers in the garage yep. would, would count. Uh, well, it depends. If it's an open-air uh, garage, yeah, there's no, well, not no walls, but uh, it, there's a lot of um, openings to the outside. It does not come under interior. Uh, air quality. But if it was a closed garage that just had a rolling door like might come under an apartment building, yes. uh, then it probably would. Yes, yeah, because then it could migrate to the uh, habitable spaces. It's only when the garage is open. Yeah, but that's come up uh, before. It's a very good question. What, what components com uh, have to comply in the garage um, situation? Uh, Matt, do you have um, any more questions there? I do not currently have any more. I just want to let everyone know I did post the link to the CSI practice group page for sustainability um, in the chat box as well as the link um, to the USGBC site that Richard had mentioned is hard to find. Um, that's in the PowerPoint, but I did also post it in the chat box for anyone that wants to grab that right away. Um, I do not see any additional questions and no hands are raised. Um, so that's the, the link right there on the screen as well. Um, so at this point, um, I do not see any additional, oh, wait, we have one here quick. Um, if painting, um, if one is painting an MDF floor in parentheses stage, would this be um, at 100, wait a second, would this be at 100 um, GL for flooring or at 550 GL for lacquer? <laughs> What's the uh, material again in question? Um, it would be well, painting over an MDF floor. Um, painting over a medium density fiberboard floor that might be used as a stage in a building. Yeah, it, it, <clears throat> the uh, substrate would not matter, but what's the finish? What are you being put well, on? Well, they were. He was. Uh, the question was, what would be the VOC limit for the finish? Um, would it finish? be? Well, what's let's say it's a, a lacquer. Oh, lacquer. Or a polyurethane. Or yeah, then, so then they I would, would comply I would, under their own um, 
their own sections. Yeah, the lacquer would come under clear wood finish and be South Coast 113 in the limits 550 under the new okay. table. Uh, Rich, Richard, did you have any uh, um, closing thoughts or words? Um, uh, only that this website or this PowerPoint will be on CSI's website if you want to refer back to it. It is, again, a, a complicated credit. Uh, they're going to make you work to get this one. Um, and by looking over this and the, the many uh, different standards and the two options, uh, eventually it will come clear. Well, thank you for sharing your, your expertise from the trenches. Um, actually, um, the new the new templates and credits, and um, and to those um, who've uh, signed in, um, thank you again for attending our next uh, sustainability practice group. Will um, be the same time next month from two to three on Tuesday, February fifteenth. A topic will be um, announced uh, uh, within the next week, and of course, we invite you to present or or suggest topics. Um, so. Thank you again. Um, thank you, Matt, for, for and CSI for making this happen. Um, um, see you next month.